So uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, my name is Eddie Adams. I'm going to be uh, moderating this uh, Green City panel. Uh, more of that shortly, but a little housekeeping thing before I forget. Uh, during the break, we found the um, credit card, the hotel room, and also the RER ticket of uh, uh, one of our participants, uh, Tanya Kruber. So Tanya, if you are out there and wondering where the hell's my credit card and my room <laughs> ticket, so seriously, this is, uh, I'm going I'm to pop it down here. Tanya, are you there? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Do you want to give Tanya a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, that's a nice phrase. So, welcome back. Uh, and a big welcome back, actually. As Adele and Ed said, you know, it's been a while. Uh, you're all looking fantastic, just the way you re I remember you, although it is a bit dark up here, so, uh, but I'm sure you look great. Um, so we're going to um, kick off a series of three uh, panel sessions, one today, one tomorrow morning, one tomorrow afternoon at the end of, the, at the end of tomorrow's uh, business. Uh, each of those is linked to one of the three uh, RBAC themes in the new programming period. So uh, gender uh, equal cities and uh, digital are both coming tomorrow. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the green city uh, today, following on from Carlos Moreno's presentation, um, which was, I think, super interesting, very stimulating, uh, and also ahead of lots of discussions in the coming days about what, what we mean by a green city and what we mean by a climate neutral city. So before we uh, jump into things, let me uh, introduce our panel. We have three uh, eminent, fantastic people on stage, and one person, Ugo Gornacho from the European Commission, joining us uh, remotely. This is a new hybrid existence we're in, where it's kind of, uh, you know, some people here, some people elsewhere, but uh, that's, uh, I guess, uh, the, the, f the future. Uh, and also great that our act is, uh, I guess, it's sort of uh, showing the way by showing how uh, these kind of events, big events, how they can be as low carbon as possible. So all of that is fantastic. We'll be talking a bit about that. Great, there's Hugo joining us, great stuff. Um, let me go uh, across the, the floor to our panelists. First of all, uh, Yeva Kalnina he joins us from the city of Riga. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, great to see you. Do you want to say a few words, first of all, about um, uh, where you're from, which, which our back network you're with, and maybe a little flavor of how you're going to come into this conversation. How does this green city theme connect with the work that you do? Okay, thank you. Thank you for having, having me here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in person um, and see everyone, finally. Um, yes, my name is Iel Kalminja. I'm from the capital city of Latvia, city of Riga. And um, I'm a circular economy expert and coordinator of international projects at, at Riga Energy Agency. And um, Riga Energy Agency is the coordinating body of all climate and energy related issues in the municipality. So sustainable energy and climate action plan is our responsibility. That's, that's our main uh, planning document that sets the scene for, for climate neutrality, how to get there. Um, my field of compet uh, uh, competence, which is circular economy, is strongly influenced and shaped by the Urbac Action Planning Network urge circular building cities and uh, I'm really grateful for all the opportunities provided by this uh, urge project uh, because it brought circular economy in municipality and opened doors for wider implementation of circular economy which is a cornerstone for climate neutrality we can't go without it Thanks a lot, Eva, and we'll okay. hear more about that later. And mm -hmm. there is, of course, a session on the circular economy uh, in these coming days. Uh, there's also one on the donut economy, which is another of the new paradigms alongside the 15-minute city. So lots of things for us to dive in more deeply in the coming days around this theme we're talking about now. Let's keep moving uh, across the floor. Uh, Laura Lundgren. Laura, great to see you from Espo in Finland. Again, welcome. Just tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about where you connect with our back and, and maybe a little flavor of the work that you do in relation to this theme. Hello, everyone. So I'm the project manager for Espo City in the project Health and Green Space. And uh, I work in the environmental production unit. My field of expertise is nature, biodiversity, and urban planning in the city of Espo. So yeah, there is the green city in there, the actual 
forests and green areas. Thanks a lot, Lara. Uh, last but not least on the stage, we've got Matthew. Matthew Bath from Eclay. Many of you know Matthew and there's many Eclay cities here. Matthew, thanks a lot for joining us again. Just tell us a little bit about the work that you do and how it connects with this conversation we're about to have. Great. Thanks a lot, Ed. Yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I work then for Eclay, which is a network of local regional governments. Many of you know I've been interacting remotely with so many of you for a long time, so it's really good to be here. My work focuses on how, when we try to make our cities greener, how can we do so in a way that's also inclusive, equitable, and ultimately just. Um, so I haven't been part of a planning network. I hope at one point I'll have the chance to listen in a bit more, but uh, maybe you're back for. But uh, yeah, happy to be here today. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Matthew, and great to have you with us. Um, let's turn now to our screen. Uh, Ugo, can you hear us? Yeah, great. Sure. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, Ugo Gramaccio, Project Advisor of the European Research Executive Agency at the European Commission. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ugo. Again, maybe just uh, share with the audience where you connect with this conversation that we're having this afternoon. So, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I would have loved to be in Paris with you all, but unfortunately, due to other commitment, I'm staying not that far. Um, so I am actually uh, thrilled to be here because Woodback is a very important program, uh, but I do work in another EU-funded program, which is, uh, um, you know, used to be Horizon 2020 and currently is the, uh, you know, the next uh, EU-funded program for research in Norwich, which is Horizon Europe. So I deal with the management of a bulk of projects that involve cities uh, uh, dealing with research innovation action on uh, nature-based solutions. So not only tackling energy, climate adaptation and mitigation, but also linking at, looking at the link with social justice, uh, economic development, and also culture. How do we make the link between natural and cultural capital, for instance? So I believe that Today's panel is pretty relevant. I'm very happy to see some familiar faces on stage. Thank okay. you for the invitation. Thanks a lot, Ugo, and we will bring you in as we go through this discussion. Um, we had a, a, a kind of planning meeting last week, uh, just before the, the, the session today, and one of the things we talked about was uh, what assumptions can we make about the audience? Uh, how much does the audience know about what we're going to talk about? So we're going to have a little exercise here just to see how much you do know. Um, we're not going to use anything digital, but we're going to use something very old-fashioned. Uh, I'm just going to ask you, um, if you think you are um, quite expert in this field, and that might be a specific angle of the field, it might be about the energy transition, might be about mobility, might be about circular economy. If you think you're pretty well up on this topic, can you stand up, please? We're not going to ask you any questions. Don't worry, we're not going to bring you in or, or, or point a finger at you. We're just curious to know. So stand up. If you think you're, you're pretty well up on the things we're about to discuss, uh, just stand up so we get some sense of the, the level of uh, knowledge there is in the room. Okay? Okay. Is that helpful? What would you reckon? Maybe 5%, 10% maybe? Okay, thank you. Sit down. If you're uh, kind of 50-50 and you, you, you actually have a pretty good understanding but you wouldn't call yourself an expert, but you're pretty conversant with some of the topics we're about to discuss. Again, will you just uh, stand up so we can, we can see? Uh, we can see, okay, okay, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. So let's ask you all some questions. No, no. Uh, okay, uh, you sit down And then, uh, the, the last but not least, uh, and this is uh, no kind of reflection on, so if, you, if you're an expert on other things, by you, by you, uh, <laughs> by you, uh, but you really don't know too much about the topic we're about to uh, discuss this afternoon. Can you stand up, please, so we can, we can if, you're, if you're quite new to this, or you're unfamiliar, or this is just absolutely not your area, can you stand up? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I think the biggest group are the, the middle group. The biggest group are the ones who are uh, kind of, uh, you know, reasonably conversant. And one final thing. Um, the two cities on the stage here are, are members of a really unique and lucky group, uh, uh, which is this uh, new 100 climate neutral cities group, 112 actually, because my city Glasgow is also uh, in that group, which is great. Um, but there are other Arbac cities who are also in that group. If your city is one of the 100 climate neutral cities, could you stand up please? Okay, can we give them a round of applause? Well done. 
Well done. Thank you. Great to see. OK. Um, so let's start with the, on, the, on the positives. Uh, and one of the things that's uh, distinctive about the new programming period is we've got the European Green Deal in response to the climate emergency, a phrase which I think Adele used earlier on today. Brings huge resources, really mobilizes a lot of commitment towards this key central theme of trying to make Europe the first climate neutral bloc by 2050. If you're in that 100 cities, it's 2030, in fact. So there's a real sense of urgency to this. Um, so lots of funding available, lots of opportunities available. Um, can I just ask, how do cities optimize that opportunity? Because the money comes in at the EU level, the national level. Cities aren't always at the table. So how do, how do, how do cities make sure they can make the most of this, this opportunity, of these opportunities we see around us? I'll maybe ask you, first of all, Eva, to, to, to get us started on that one. So from, from your perspective in Riga, you're one of the hundred, uh, these hundred uh, climate neutral cities. What, 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 what is the opportunity you see there, and how do you make the most of it? OK, the climate neutrality is a, actually an ambition. And to fulfill this ambition, it takes courage to make uh, respective decisions and to implement those actions. And I think that's my personal opinion, that uh, some of those decisions are not really popular, and it could be even a political suicide at the end. But uh, yeah, someone recognizes that. Um, <laughs> that's true, because there's no easy way to do that. That's the first thing. It's ambition and courage. And um, secondly, it's a complex approach. And um, in Riga, green transition goes uh, far beyond implementing single projects. And um, it takes complex, integrated, shout out to all action planning networks, and uh, <laughs> strategic planning behind uh, single activities. And it takes uh, cross-sectoral cooperation as well. And the uh, third thing I would like to raise is um, citizens like in the center, involvement and uh, inclusion, both. Involvement to involve them in, in your activities so they can participate, influence it somehow, and um, get this ownership of the goals. And um, inclusion, that's, that's of course, uh, that's really important, not only just because everyone should be included, like equal rights or something like that, but uh, we, we are not allowed to make sustainability as a luxury. It can't be a luxury. It should be available for everyone. So these okay. would be three points of me. OK. So, so you've, you've set the ball rolling, and some, quite a few things we'll pick up in the conversation. Um, Laura, we, we were speaking earlier on using Espoo as the second biggest city in Finland. That's uh, true. Yeah. Next to Helsinki. <laughs> OK. Um, how, will, how will you optimize this opportunity? How will you, how will you make sure that you mobilize the resources available to you through the European Green Deal, Green Deal and the other kind of structures that we see in place now? Well, we try to have more smart solution and more innovations. Uh, we are lucky to have one university, Aldo University in the ESPO, and quite many companies. So in the coming years, we're trying to have more co-work with the universities and uh, businesses to find these smart solution in that way uh, change the behavior of the citizens. Okay, thanks a lot. And, and Matthew, I declare you're working with networks of cities. Uh, again, you're very close to, to, to helping them develop practical solutions. Again, what, 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 how, how do we make sure that they are best placed to, 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 to maximize uh, the, the resources and, and, the, and the other kind of um, support which we now see coming into play? Yeah, um, it's a really good question also because it's not just about one level here. So, I mean, it's not, we can't just look then at the cities on their own, in their own territories, but we have to look at them in the broader context of multi-level cooperation. Because I think if we really want cities to deliver on the goals of the European Green Deal, and in a sense, make it a localized also Green Deal, then they need to work then together with the regional, national, EU levels of government. This is absolutely essential if we're really going to get and deal with the climate emergency that's been mentioned before. 
Um, and actually networks like uh, organizations like Urbact have a crucial role here in linking the different levels here. This is very important. Um, one more point that I just want to bring up here is that cities are taking what I would call a deliberative turn, and this is also being very strongly supported. Maybe I'm going to take some things away from Ugo here. Sorry, Ugo. <laughs> but I think the commission is also really supporting in looking at how we, can, how we can be more deliberative and participatory in moving towards this Green Deal and how can we ensure that everyone is included, not just in a tick box fashion, fashion and that's very important as well. Okay. Ooh, would you want to pick up on that? Because I saw you smiling there, reacting. So the, the key question is about how we help cities to, to make the most of this opportunity. Again, again what's your take on, on this and maybe jumping in on what Matthew's just said as well? Sure, Matthew and I often have a ton of common approach, so you won't see any conflict on that aspect. Uh, I think uh, my reflection would be on how do we also see at the European level government. I think we need from this kind of vertical approach to governance when it comes to sustainable city, you know, the European, national, regional, and local level, uh, so either top down or bottom up approach to sustainable smart city. It was a more horizontal government where I believe for climate neutral smart cities, what we really need is a different kind of cooperation. Where, for instance, if you look at the research and innovation solutions that we are uh, proposed to go towards the direction of becoming the first climate neutral continent in the EU, it's really like uh, how do we make sure that the participation that we are fostering in terms of co-creation on the local level with cities is mirrored at the European level? So how do we make sure that while financing different projects and fostering communication between different city departments, but being the one on infrastructure, the one on green solution, the one on actually housing or social inclusion, we do the same level of communication and synergies at the European level between the different commission regimes and agencies, for instance, but also between programs and between projects funded by different programs. So I really believe that that this work on climate neutrality at the EU level has to be mirrored at city level. And that's why the EU mission on um, climate neutral smart cities is a great way to do that, a great way to connect and join the dots between different, actually, level of organizations communicating in this complex polycentric domain. Thanks a lot. And that connects us nicely to, uh, I was going to pick up on, you know, the, the launch yesterday was of the, you know, the, the launch of the, uh, you know, the climate neutral cities was yesterday in Brussels. Uh, I'm sure colleagues from ESPO and Riga would have been there to, to get things started. Um, what, what does that actually mean if you're, if you're in, that, in that group of cities? Uh, and you, well, first of all, it means you've got a target of 2030, so you've got a really, you know, a, you know, a, a, a big, big incentive and a, a kind of a big uh, red flag in, in the not so distant future. But in terms of um, resources and, 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 and kind of opportunities, what, what does it mean for, 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 I mean, for ESPO, first of all? Uh, what are the implications for you of being inside that, that, that group? At least it uh, shows to us that we have done something right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even though we are quite big city, sometimes even we are unsure that is this the right way to go. And sometimes we as well are afraid, as you were talking about, to be brave. So to be part of this kind of mission encourages us to continue what we have done and maybe try something new and exciting. Yeah, but you talked about, you know, you mentioned what is there, ambition, courage, bravery. I mean, it's interesting that these are the kind of adjectives, that the, you know, the, the nouns that we're talking about rather than technical things. So these are attitudinal things about, you know, governance, leadership. Again, you know, what, what does it mean for, for, for your city, capital city, of course, in Latvia, to be inside this, this group of 100? What, what will actually happen as a result of that? Um, not yet. Nothing, <laughs> not yet, nothing yet. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just recently announced, but we are really happy and we worked to do to, to that uh, purposely. It wasn't an accident, of course. Um, but um, I can tell you what will happen, mm. if you like. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> please do, yeah. Uh, so first of all, if you want someone to do something like, like this climate neutrality, again, is our, our common goal. If you want, want others to do something, you have to do it yourself at first. 
like practice what you preach, be a role model and so on. Yeah. So we are going to start with um, making our muni municipality institutions as sustainable as possible. Our municipal infrastructure climate neutral and resilient to the risks caused by the climate change. So these are like working with ourselves. And then there are two main fields of pain, I would say. Uh, two biggest challenges uh, to work on, which are um, urban transport and uh, residential housing. These are like two bi biggest issues and we have a plan how to do, like how to get there. I don't know how much time do I have? No, you can say, you can, you can say a bit more about the housing. So what, what you know, that, what, because we read a chat, Matthew had been in Riga when we spoke last week and you talked specifically, Matthew, about the housing issues. So tell us what the housing issue is. What, what's, what's the biggest challenge in relation to the housing from, from the perspective of Riga? Okay, uh, we have approximately 6,000 multi-apartment re residential buildings that needs to be renovated urgently. Uh, but uh, in our plans is to renovate at least one third of them uh, by 2030. And uh, we already know that there are not enough financial support for that. Yeah. Um, there are different tools and schemes and so on, but it will not be enough to fulfill this target. That's why we are um, establishing um, Riga Energy Efficiency Fund uh, to finance deep retrofit, as well as uh, on-site renewable energy production. So we believe that this, this should help and uh, make a difference. Okay, thank you. Hugo, if you want to come in, just pop your finger up and I'll see you and I'll bring you into the conversation. Um, I mean, you, you, we started talking a bit about challenges uh, and, and I think we mentioned earlier on this whole thing about bringing people with us. Um, I, I, and I guess, I mean, maybe I'll bring you and Matthew. I mean, what, what are the, what, what are the, you know, this is, nev this is, not, this is never going to be easy. And we'll talk about Ukraine actually specifically shortly. And uh, it's good that we already talked about Ukraine on the stage. And we'll, you know, clearly if we'd be having a different conversation six months ago to the one we we're about to have now. So in terms of the energy impact, let's come on to that shortly. But leaving that aside for the moment, um, what kinds of challenges, what are the biggest challenges cities face in, in terms of achieving the goal of climate neutrality by 2050 or indeed 2030? Just as a tiny little question. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just want to say one of the biggest issues is time, is simply yeah. time. Mm -hmm. If you want to retrofit all your buildings, make everything energy efficient, if you want to do all this, it's not just, you don't just need money, you need time, it takes time, and it, it can't happen overnight. You also need people to be able to do it. You need materials and so on and so forth. So it becomes very quickly, when we think about this at scale, a very challenging question. And so it's on the one hand, it's fantastic that we have the mission, that we have the 100 plus 12 cities that have raised their ambitions, that are taking concrete steps towards that. I think that's, that's absolutely essential, but we have to also recognize that it's not going to happen overnight and 2030 is not very far away. Yeah. And then to add a little bit to that, I mean, we, we heard before that there are a number of smaller and medium-sized cities here today, and they face very different challenges also in moving towards climate neutrality and general kind of sustainability in cities. They don't necessarily have the resources, the, the, the knowledge, the infrastructure in place to do this at pace. And yeah. so I think if we want to really tackle this seriously, we also then really need to think about how we bring all of the cities and towns with us. And Eclay, for example, is working with an approach called Local Green Deals, which is not so far from, uh, from the mission where the local government, the residents, the stakeholders come together to try to decide, okay, how can we do this in a concrete manner? But of course, this still doesn't necessarily get us all the way, so we need as many efforts to do this as possible and it's not a matter of this or that, it's a matter of and. Yeah, okay. Um, Laura, just on this question of challenges, again, anything you'd want to put your finger on? I mean, from, from your perspective in ESPO, what are the, the things that maybe keep people lying awake at night worrying about it because they think this is something which might be really difficult to shift in the limited time we have? Um, maybe it's the image 
for what you want from the Espo, the citizens. So the citizens of Espo, they really would like to have that one single house with very big garden, probably two cars or even three cars, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. So yeah, the chains in Espo will be huge <laughs> in some parts of Espo, and uh, some of the citizens don't like it. They like you are destroying what was the very nice Espo. Now it's something different. I don't recognize that this is the Espo. So that is a one challenge for us. Uh, we are building new uh, metro stations and also quite a lot of housing around those stage stations as well. And uh, those centrals will be looking very different that we now have. There will be tall buildings. Yeah. And uh, from there you can see the differences. And that means that uh, some parts of the Espo will come quite different looking from each other. So how to st still keep the spirit of we are Espo coherent? Okay, that, that, I mean, we'll come back to the narrative and how we frame this and how we kind of, uh, I guess, reposition it in a, in, a, in a positive way rather than being a lose-lose scenario, which is how many people kind of uh, see it. Um, I don't know whether from the conversations yesterday, with, with, with the, the, the group of 100 neutral cities. Anything else that jumped out there from the challenges and things which, uh, from your position, you think we need to really put our finger on? Yeah, I believe that there is one point that I would like to start first with an opportunity and then turn to the challenge. I think the opportunity based on the discussion we're just having about uh, the mission on climate neutral smart cities that the uh, city, the climate city concept will be a demand driven which means that there is not one solution fit all. I mean, each city within this group will be able to focus either on retrofitting buildings, uh, addressing energy poverty, or using, for instance, uh, um, spreading nature-based solutions for climate adaptation and disaster action, or tackling more uh, issues around vulnerability. So I think that the uh, demand-driven uh, angle of uh, the climate contract within the mission will definitely allow cities to decide which is the best solution to address some of the challenges that we've been mentioning and also to kind of go beyond this distinction between you know front planner and follower cities i think we really paved the way to the mission to understand that what we need is a network of networks and that's why it play another next network very important to us because i think the more the merrier this is not a single city F, this is a multiplier F. And the challenge, uh, going back to your question and see there, is also monitoring. How do we make sure yeah. that we really become climate neutral while not leaving, you know, we don't need to leave no one behind? So how do we make sure that we have data that are really um, at different level, at different scales, uh, able to monitor and assess what we're achieving throughout our journey to climate neutrality, which cannot be only energy-related data, it needs to be also the global environmental impact assessment, the social component, and the economic one. So how do we make sure that the interoperability of data at city level reflects a bit of what is collected at national level to census to these are big challenges that we still have in school? Yeah. Thanks, Hugo. We'll pick up on the just transition point shortly. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we'll hopefully have time to, to pull out some questions from the audience. If you have things you want to ask our panelists, then uh, you know, we'll, I'll ask you to stick a few hands up shortly and we'll, we'll bring some roving mics out. Um, before we move on to this whole question of just transitions and the, 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 climate, the climate and social justice conversation, um, you know, uh, let's go back to the, the, the kind of Ukraine question. Um, and maybe, I mean, thinking about I'll ask the two cities uh, specifically, when you, when you applied for your, you know, to be part of the 100 climate neutral cities, the world looked quite different to how it, how it is now. Um, and, um, you know, we don't need to explain here the impact of what's happening and the, the, the tragedy of the war in, in Ukraine at the moment. But um, in terms of the, does this rip up the rule book from a city perspective in terms of how you approach this? Because we had John Kerry last week talking about, we must use this as an excuse to duck our targets, we keep, have to keep our eyes on the prize, we have to keep focused on, on, on the bigger picture. Uh, but you know, it has major implications around you know, energy, around lots of aspects of connected with the wider conversation of climate neutrality. 
Um, I mean, yeah, but maybe first of all, from from a uh, you know Baltic state perspective, um, uh, yeah, does does this is this a game changer in terms of how you approach this, or is it business as usual with some slight modifications? What's the what's the angle? Of course, it's not simple, and it's not like it was before February ten twenty fourth. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's completely different scene. Um, I would say. There are some positive aspects. For example, uh, people are actively thinking how to switch to renewables, how to produce energy on site. Uh, they are looking for alternative means of transport, but it comes together with downsides. And uh, we can, I think we can pretty shortly expect some shortages and bottlenecks regarding uh, production and uh, delivery of those new solutions, green solutions, uh, like, for example, I don't know, solar panels, whatever yeah. we are buying. Uh, yeah, Matthew already touched that. Um, financial capacity to finance that. We have financial support systems, and you can apply for grants. To, to implement these measures, but uh, it's understandable that will not be enough for everyone. And um, of course, uh, human resource capacity, for example, construction or our renovation story, do we have en enough construction companies that can handle that? So it's pretty much sure that we will not manage just to switch in one season. Okay. Okay. How about in Finland, Lara? I mean, you see mindset changes in Finland already. Finland, I think you've joined in NATO, that long border with Russia, and I know it's had a big psychological impact in Finland. So in terms of this, this uh, question about business as usual, or does it transform the conversation in relation to energy and the green transition? Uh, if you look only at the level of ESPO, I don't think that this is a game changer. Okay. Of course, there will be some impacts for sure uh, i think the biggest thing is that the uncertainty is like you said do we get all the supplies do we get all the workers to do the things that we would like to build up and when uncertainties rise then again the threshold to try something new also rises and unfortunately maybe some people will say that now that we are having this crisis let's hold on, let's do that thing, that climate thing later. And like you said, we don't have any time. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are in the rush at the moment. And I think that in this case, that we are part of the mission, helps us to remind that we don't have the time, even though now we are having a crisis, we have to move forward now. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, useful points. Um, I mean, and, and again, we talked uh, earlier, um, and, and you mentioned actually, Laura, this notion of not leaving people behind. Um, I'll, I'll maybe actually bring Matthew in, because you and I had a conversation about this in relation to just transitions and s s some other work that uh, we're involved in. And I guess if, if we're looking at um, who, who's most at risk of being left behind, and this notion of just transitions is we move to climate neutrality without leaving any places or people behind, so we bring everybody with us. Um, you know, if you grew up in a city like mine, Glasgow, we don't have a very good history of successful industrial transitions. Usually they are bad news, they're turbulent, they're losers and winners, you know, it's something which makes people feel anxious. Um, looking ahead and from the work that you're doing with, with your Eclay members, who, who's most at risk in cities of being left behind in this, this energy, this transition that we're involved in at the moment? Well, I think... <clears throat> The important thing is to not focus on any one group. I think that's that's really important. So, so uh, sometimes discussions of how to have a just transition get a bit monopolized with looking at coal regions or carbon intensive industries and things like that. But the truth is a just transition to a carbon neutral Europe goes everywhere. All territories, all cities, all towns have to deal with this. And so we, we have, this is the challenge we need to ensure, we need to have a broader rethink, and we cannot just rely on crises to have, to rip up a small part of the rule book, I'd say, yeah. but you know, it's not just about the chapter, we need to think about the broader framework that we have. So this means also thinking about questions like what are our values? What are values 
guiding this transition? Are we going to move from competition towards more cooperation, from exploitation to regeneration, towards values like care and solidarity, which I think we have seen the capacity for solidarity is very much there. And I think this is what we really need to keep in mind. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but maybe just expands upon it. Okay. Ugu, from the conversations yesterday, uh, and from the, the, the wider discussion within the climate neutral cities and, and the work that you're doing. Um, again, who, who's most at risk? Who are, who are the most uh, kind of marginalized and vulnerable groups who need to be on our radar as we think about uh, how we support people to make this transition? I think this is a challenging question because uh, the idea every time we want to use the you know, co-creation with citizens or like tackling some of the issues around vulnerability, we always uh, tend to have an idea of communities as monolithic, as very homogeneous. And what we see in current cities like Brussels, which is one of the most diversified cities in, in the world actually, is that actually we are not homogeneous at all. So even when the city has the most uh, good, you know, the best intention to involve everyone, actually is everyone gets very easily deluded. Because on the one hand, you can have uh, a group by group approach by trying to look at each marginalized uh, group, um, this expression, and therefore you go by other categories of uh, different uh, personal characteristics, disabled people, elderly, uh, women, LGBTI, but then also by doing that, you might actually miss uh, the intersectionality part. So I really agree uh, with Matthew, but I think there the need uh, to intersectionalize the personal characteristic of citizens also needs to go hand, on, hand by hand with the need to intersectionalize different geographies. Because a city as, as such is not either monolithic. So you have uh, different neighborhoods uh, and different actually even streets that connect neighborhoods where problems can be highly different. So I think we also need to be more cautious when we have uh, any plan that goes towards linking the green and the brown agenda to make sure that we are really listening to diversified voices uh, and not just to a sample of diversified groups at the end there. Sure, yeah. And of course, one of the, one of the, the risks is, you know, we can move to being a climate neutral city, but at the same time, kind of widening inequalities. Uh, so it's going to be, become a very kind of bourgeois, wealthy, green, and then affordability is another part of this conversation. Uh, I mean, in, in, in Riga, uh, uh, is work going on to look at uh, who, which sections of the community need to be part of this conversation? Uh, I know that, you know, as part of our back, we talk about engaging stakeholders, we talk about practical tools of, uh, you know, implementing integrated approaches, which you talked about already. Um, what kind of... Uh, Groups or what kind of sections of, of, of your city are you are you most keen to make sure they're they're on board and involved in these discussions and, and these actions? Mm, I think the most vulnerable are those who have the least possibilities to influence their yeah. situation. So with lower income, seniors, and uh, maybe even those who can't apply for grants for some reason. Maybe they are not seniors or, <laughs> or something, but they just fell off uh, the requirements and they can't apply and they can't simply do that. Or as I said, uh, the capacity, there's someone will be who, who took first mm -hmm. and someone who didn't manage to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time again. <laughs> it's about timing again. Yeah. Yeah, as well. Lara, again, and Espo, uh, this this question about uh, who we are, who we are kind of are we, are we focusing on specific groups or is it more about this in intersectionality that, that Matthew and Hugo have talked about? Uh, for us, it's a question of, of uh, space. Uh -huh. So uh, the city of Espo, we don't have one city central. We have five different city central. So that is our urban structure, and uh, all of these centrals are connected to the Helsinki metropolitan area uh, by local train or a metro. Well, that's great. That is the way to, uh, to uh, do the climate change things, mm -hmm. right? But then again, uh, Espoo is a very big city when it comes to land cover. That is 300 square kilometers. 
and we have 300,000 citizens. And all of them are not living on those five city centrals or even close to them. So if our solution for the climate change is that everybody is living in these centrals and can use the local train or metro, and we focus all our services also to the city centrals, then there are some people who are living far away from those centrals that are left behind, and they have to use car. So that is our challenge. Okay. Thanks, Laura. And again, you know, in the coming days, in our different workshop sessions, breakout sessions with a chance to go more deeply into this, including a session on just transitions, which takes place tomorrow afternoon, I think, which Matthew and I are both uh, taking part in. Um, I've suddenly had a clock pop up on the screen here, which I think means uh, but the clock's going up the way, not down the way, so it's not a countdown clock. I'm not sure whether it means get off the stage or keep talking, so um, I'm looking at Dell and Ed to, uh, to... I think it's maybe time for us to wrap things up a little bit. I'll maybe ask... Um, let me ask each of you just to think a little bit about um, the, the, whether there's a niche role for our backed. So we talked about, you know, Adele mentioned this is the time for us to launch a new program. We're kind of building on what we've done in the past. We are kind of um, focusing on these three themes, which in fact are interconnected. I mean, digital and, 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 and uh, you know, climate change are both mega trends. Uh, gender cuts through everything, and there's no doubt this, this, is a, this conversation strongly connects with gender equal cities also, so uh, it's a slightly artificial you know, distinction where we'll cut cr cr across all three. But in terms of where our back might add value, this is a busy, congested landscape, lots of agencies working in these spaces, lots of uh, things already happening. Is, is there a kind of niche space? Is there a kind of sweet spot, or is there some, some you know, is it something we need to be doing more of? that connects with what our back does well that you, you might suggest that our back sort of uses to focus on in the next programming period? That's a very long question. My apologies. Real, it's been a long, hot day. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but do you want to jump in and give us some thoughts initially, and then I'll go to Laura? Um, I can do my evaluation of, like, ongoing project, which is about to end, Verge, Circular Building Cities. Um, what I really appreciated was uh, the opportunity to do the small scale actions. And I think that's something Urbac should continue doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand this was first or I don't know, second time when they, tr first time, yeah, when they tried out and they were just like curious what to do and how to do it. And my suggestion would be go and keep on doing that. That was really valuable to, okay. to see how it's because when you plan, it's more, more of theory, or you just discuss it and, and you think how it will be. And I can compare how we planned the small scale action and how it actually went. There were differences, so it was really nice cool. to have. Cool, great. I guess, I guess also it concretizes what is sometimes quite a big abstract kind of issue for people also, yeah. Yeah, and helps to shape those yeah. actions. Yeah, further. okay. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, Laura, what about you? Uh, I would say that city visits. Mm -hmm. So no matter what is the size of the city, where the city is, city is always a city. So to me, in uh, health and green space project, I, I got very much information just when I could see the city itself. So some things are lost in translation and in cultural differences. Uh, urban planning, it's very different in different cities and sometimes very hard to explain through PowerPoint presentation what we are trying to do, but to actually go to the city and see it, you understand much, much, much more and learn much, much more. So I would like to have more city visits in the future. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, good, good suggestion. Adele and I were both in Manchester last Thursday. Uh, and the, the Manchester small-scale action was around uh, uh, sort of designing a, a climate assembly with citizens. And we had some of the citizens there talking about that opportunity and how uh, it really kind of helped them to, to feel less helpless. Because in a sense, some of us feel completely helpless. What can, as an individual, as a family, as a, you know, what do we, what we do against the scale of this? So I think it's really good to hear, first of all, that, that, that shared 
uh, experience, but also the fact that they're able to design some practical things together. So the notion of city visits, because other cities who were there, I know were really listening carefully. Uh, but also, as you said, Yeva, it's a small practical thing which is quite easy to launch and, and, and can you know, be scaled up into uh, on a much higher level. Matthew, you working at Clay, you, you're, you work all about networks, you know about city networks, you know our bike quite well. Again, any sort of thoughts from your side on what our bike's niche position might be going forward on this? Well, I think it, it's obvious to me that there is space, there is a real space for Urbac here in this kind of green cities context. I first of all would say, I don't think this niche can get too crowded in the sense that we need more and more efforts. We need also this kind of approach which is with and for the cities. This is really, really crucial and something that Urbact is very, is very famous for, that we know that the cities truly appreciate this, and that's what I've been hearing from Laurel and Yeva. Um, and so I think that that's a real opportunity here also to put in place this kind of translocal learning, learning across localities. I think this is something that has to happen more. But in addition to that, I would hope that then more and more also the partnerships between Urbact and the other organizations working within this niche grow stronger so that then we don't just have a profusion of initiatives and efforts, but also a coordinated effort hopefully towards a, a common strategic vision for where do we want to go as an urban Europe. Great, thank you. I'll give the last word to you, Hugo, on this. Thanks, I think, uh, you know, although we've been working on EU R&I funding, what I found particularly uh, exceptional from uh, uh, Urbac program is this capacity building across the net. I think it doesn't matter if you're talking about the municipality inclusion, physical uh, development of cities. I mean, a city is one city, and often actually the one that a part of the urban network, then we are also in charge of other EU-funded uh, programs. So to me, this cross-fertilization we have been promoting, thanks also the active cooperation, for instance, from between Urbac and Horizon uh, 2020, and now Horizon Europe, and this one is amazing, because you can see a small scale being uh, let's say, the center of Urbac, and then the city applied for, you know, 10 million projects in Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe, and develop that idea even more, and cross fertilize that so with something more related to the diversity of life projects. So I think this idea of having a program with this capacity building and networking between cities has helped other EU-funded programs to flourish, and that should not be taken for granted. So I think we should definitely go ahead with this capacity building, capacity building also of expertise and experts, because we shouldn't forget the great network of, of experts that we've been also relying on in other e-funded programs. And I think this is a common trajectory that we should just make even stronger in terms of synergies of e-funded programs. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, Ugo. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to all of you for patiently uh, listening. Again, I know it's been a long day. Many of you have traveled today. Uh, we'll carry on these conversations in the coming days. But uh, for the moment, could you just give a big round of applause to our panelists? Thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll leave the stage this way. And Adele and Ed are going to come back on this way. Yeah, great. Thanks that. a lot, everyone. Fantastic transition. Yeah, thanks a lot, Hugo. See you soon.